Deck Building. I am your host, Demo, and uh, let's talk about this whole bracket thing. I, I know there's a lot of buzz probably all over the internet talking about the potential for this bracket thing and going forward, how is it going to work in the commander format? There's lots of conspiracy theories floating around. I thought I would just do a general discussion video about it, throw out some questions for you guys to sort of get the wheels turning of how things might work. Is this actually going to happen? Again, we're, we're maybe getting ahead of ourselves. Sure, I will admit that that might be a situation here where this doesn't even happen. I think it kind of is. I, I think it is likely that there's no way that they would bring that up, right? And if, I'll get to it if you're not familiar, but with the RC stepping down, that announcement, bringing up that bracket thing to me is like, okay, well, why would they even do that if it wasn't even going to happen? I think they did it just to get us used to the idea which obviously everyone is doing because we're all talking about it. It's possible that there's enough pushback there that they decide not to, but my feeling is they're gonna go ahead with this. So if you're not up on the news, basically the rules committee has stepped down and they are moving forward with sort of maybe possibly a new way of doing things. So what they said here is, here's the idea, there are four power brackets and every commander deck can be placed in one of those brackets by examining the cards and combinations in your deck and comparing them to lists. We'll need community help to create. You can imagine a bracket. One is the baseline for an average pre-constructed deck or below, and bracket four is high power for the lower tiers. We may lean on a mixture of cards and a description of how the deck functions and the higher tiers are likely defined by more explicit list of cards. So. Wizard of the Coast is looking for feedback. This is a great video for you guys to sort of get the ball rolling about, you know, the things you need to think about here, right? And they mention here a little bit about, you know, combination of cards. And as I bring up all the time, Pilla Pala is not a powerful card at all. That card's almost laughable, but if you combine it with Grand Architect, it creates infinite mana, right? So there would be an example of two cards that I don't think anyone, probably most people would put that in the bottom bracket, you know, the, the number one, I guess, would be the bottom. But if you combine them, now it creates an infinite loop. So now, and again, this already we're starting to get into the, the issue here because you're going to have to identify any combo potential in your deck, even if you're not aware of it. Someone else is going to have to bring it to your attention, right? Because as I mentioned in a video recently, sometimes people assemble combos in their deck that they don't even realize are there. It happened to me once where I actually had an infinite combo accidentally in my deck that I didn't realize I had, right? So if someone has a Pillapala in their deck, that's a one. But if someone also has a Grand Architect in their deck, that now knocks it up a few levels. Maybe, maybe not. They also say here, for example, you could imagine Bracket 1 has cards that easily can go in any deck, like Swords to Plowshares, Grave Titan, Cultivate, whereas Bracket 4 would have cards like Vampiric Tuner, Armageddon, and Grim Monolith, cards that make games too much more consistent, lopsided, or fast than the average deck can engage with. So... I have a big issue there, first of all. And that big issue is that Swords to Plowshares is actually a really powerful card, right? And this is what is starting to get me thinking that these power rankings aren't going to be about power. They're going to be about something else, right? If this had been, you know, if they had done this 10 years ago, I think Swords to Plowshares would be like maybe two or three, you know, that bracket. Now it's a one. Why? Every precon has it. It's been reprinted a thousand times. Everybody has it. It's the most, I think it's the third most popular uh, card in the entire format behind Soul Ring and Arcane Signet. So the power level thing is maybe more a popularity level thing, right? Swords to Plowshares is obviously a powerful card. It is the best removal spell, the best creature removal spell, hands down in the history of the game. But it's a bracket one huh? Right? See, so mm, already we're losing some consistency there, right? I mean, Grave Titan? Okay, sure. Grave Titan. I could see that being in bracket one. Cultivate? Hold on a sec now. Cultivate's Ramp, and Ramp is really powerful in the format. Again, it, it's a card that is certainly not super powerful, but a lot of people would say just Ramp in general is really, really powerful in the commander format, right? So there, we're also running into that issue as well. In this system, your deck would be defined by its highest bracket card or cards. This is where things get really cloudy for me. This makes it clear what cards go where and what kinds of cards you can expect people to be playing. For example, if Agent Tomb is a bracket four card, your deck would be generally considered a four. 
So, I mean, they're just throwing out here that Ancient Tomb is likely going to be a bracket four card. It is considered to be a really powerful card, but I'll get more to that. But if it's part of a tomb theme deck, the conversation may be my deck is four with Ancient Tomb, but two without it. Is that okay with everyone? I mean, again, th this is just an inherent issue with this whole system. And, you know, I don't want to get too much into the weeds about whether or not this is actually going to work. I'm, I'm more, more going to talk about the actual brackets and, and what could possibly go where, but you're, you're doing the rule zero thing here already. So if we're already doing rule zero, the brackets are just adding another level of possible disagreement here. Just saying, if your deck is a four with an ancient tomb, then your deck is a four with an ancient tomb. What does it matter if it's tomb themed? Is your deck more powerful than ancient tomb? Yes or no, right? That's sort of the problem with this whole bracket thing. They gave here, I think this is their official example of how the whole bracket thing would work. And again, the fact that we're looking at this means, okay, well, I guess they're likely going to move forward with this. So this is showing um, a vampiric tutor in bracket four and an Armageddon in bracket four, as I think they mentioned in the article. And the thinking here is, okay, well, Vampiric Tutor is just a really powerful tutor. I guess it's maybe the most powerful tutor. And of course, tutoring is powerful. Okay. For me, I'm thinking the fact that Vampiric Tutor is also an expensive card maybe moves it up the list as well. I think price is going to play a part in what they're saying power bracket here. I think expensive availability, all that kind of stuff is also going to play a role in where these things go and which bracket Armageddon is obviously just a card that people don't want to see in a commander game, right? Not really expensive. It's not banned in the format right now. It's just a card that people don't like to see, right? So it's going to be in bracket Four. Next up there, it looks like we have personal tutor, which is, again, it's a tutor, but it's a less good tutor. So it's going to be in a lower bracket. Okay. Dranath Magistrate. Wow. And again, this is where we're already running into the issue. There's a lot of people, a lot of people out there that hate Dranath Magistrate and want it to be banned in the format. So you have a card that a lot of people are calling to get banned not even a bracket four, it's a bracket three. And again, a lot of people will say these bracket things are, are for newer players and you know it's to help people get into the game, whatever. Newer players want to see a Dranath Magistrate in a commander game? Yeah, not likely, right? So that's already an issue here. I actually posed a question on my Discord. Uh, Tabernacle is a, again, that's another card that not only is it a super staxy card, it's also insanely expensive. And I said, would you guys rather see a Tabernacle in a Commander game or Drath Magistrate? I had a whole bunch of my patrons saying they would rather see a Tabernacle than a Drath Magistrate. So a lot of people really hate that card. So the fact that they put it in three, we're already running into issues here. So number two bracket, we got a Fabricate, which is, oh man, that's a two. I mean, it is a tutor. But again, where do you draw the lines with tutors, right? Expedition map. That's a tutor, isn't it? Where, where does that fit in here? A lot of people would consider that an insanely casual card. Most people don't have any problem at all, but usually you're going to get a very powerful land with it, right? It is essentially a tutor, although most people don't think of it that way. So where does that go on this list, right? This other card took me a while to figure out what this is. It's Thalia, which is a very, you know, again, a lot of people see a Thalia in a casual commander game and there's a lot of groaning going on. Here they seem to think, you know, it is Staxy, I hate to use that word to describe Thalia. It's more tax. Stax and tax are two different things, but people tend to combine them. It is a tax card. It just slows things down a little bit, makes you pay more mana. And a lot of people have no problem with this in a commander game, but there's a lot of people that don't love it in a commander game. And that's probably why they have it at two. But, you know, again, there's a lot of people that might put it a little bit higher. And then, of course, at one, they got swords and they got Grave Titan. And Again, Grave Titan, of course, very casual. A lot of people would say it's not even that good in Commander at all. Swords is really, really powerful, but the argument being that it is just ubiquitous. It's everywhere. So we're going to put it in one. And of course, that brings me to the first card that I'm going to bring up here, which obviously is Soul Ring. And that's what I brought up. I believe I pinned a comment to the video I did talking about this. I'm like, well, where does Soul Ring go in all of this? If we're talking power level, and I'm going to bring up a bunch of examples here just to get the wheels turning, like where would you guys stick these cards, right? If we're talking power level, this is a four. This is one of the most powerful, and I would argue it is the most powerful mana rock in the history of the game. This is a four on power level. 
right? That's why the whole power bracket thing is like, okay, if we're just talking power level, how is soldering not a four? But as a lot of people pointed out in the comments, okay, well, this has got to be in one though, just like swords to plowshares. And I think that specifically is why they didn't bring this up as an example in that little blurb they had is because they're just going to create more infighting and arguing with regards to the whole bracket thing. And they don't want that happening until they institute it. I think this is going to go in one. I think we all know it's going to go in one, which to me, you know, this card alone breaks the whole bracket thing. It is an insanely powerful card. It just completely breaks the game open on turn one often, but because it's in every single pre-con and because it is a ubiquitous card that everybody has in all their commander decks, how can you put it in a four? right? If Soul Ring is a four, which it is on power level, then that would mean that pretty much every single commander deck is a four. Not mine, by the way, because I don't play it, but pretty much everyone else's is because everyone has it in their commander deck. That's really, Soul Ring sort of breaks this whole bracket thing wide open. You really got to start with that. I would like your guys' arguments in, in the comments and with all these cards. I, I, have, I think I have four examples of cards that sort of get the wheels turning about how the whole bracket thing is going to work. Saying, yeah, Soul Ring is going to be a one just because it's in the pre-cons, a bad argument. I want a real argument. What's the real argument for why Soul Ring is not in number four, other than it's just a ubiquitous card in the format it's in, and it's in all the pre-cons? Because really, it should be. Here's an interesting one. Rest in peace, right? And of course, it is... Just a graveyard hate card. It's probably the best graveyard hate card ever, but a lot of people would consider this a stacks card, actually stacks E card, because it hates on graveyard so good that if you're playing a graveyard deck, you basically just can't do anything at all. And not only does it hate on graveyards, it hates on dies triggers. It really shuts down a whole lot of decks, like an aristocrats deck, for example. Playing your aristocrats deck, you probably wouldn't think of this so much as hating on your strategy, but it does because dies triggers is likely really, really important for you. So where does this fit? Where does a rest in peace, a very common card, I don't know how common in the format, but pretty common, a card that everyone's very familiar with, where does it fit in the brackets? Where would you guys stick rest in peace just graveyard hate. Every deck needs graveyard hate, right? You know, maybe this is too powerful graveyard hate though. It is a powerful card. What bracket does Rest in Peace fit in? Here's another perfect example of what I'm talking about. Counterspell, just good old fashioned counterspell. One of the most popular cards in the entire format. It's like number five or six or something like that. Again, similar to Swords to Plowshares where it is just throughout the history of the game considered a really powerful card and obviously there's way better options for counter spells this isn't even the best one i'm not going to start getting into force will and fierce guardianship and all of that likely those will be higher power levels but this is the most ubiquitous counter spell in the format and it is obviously inexpensive and and all of those boxes it checks as far as being a casual card but it's also very hated a lot of people really hate counter spells and they don't want to ever see them in a commander game i've talked in the past about the play group that the guy said we don't even play blue in our <laughs> group because everyone hates counter spells so much where does counter spell fit guys is this a one my thinking is it, it is a one bracket one and that th that is certainly likely going to be the case where wizards of the coast sticks this they're going to stick this in bracket one counter spells are really powerful it can stop probably 90% of the stuff you're doing in your commander deck. Where are you guys going to put Counterspell in the bracket system? Let me know. Here's a real funny one, Scrambleverse. And if you're not familiar with it, it's a six red, red sorcery for each non-land permanent. Choose a player at random. Then each player gains control of each permanent for which he or she has chosen. Untap those permanents. Where does this go, guys? And again, you could put a lot of the chaos -y cards in there. This just literally throws the game into a blender. I myself hate this card. If somebody cast it, I would likely scoop. Is it powerful? I mean, I guess it costs eight mana. Where do you put this card? For me, I would probably put this in a four. Although it's not even that powerful. So is it in a four? So this is in the same group as a Vampiric Tutor or an Ancient Tomb or whatever. You know, again, it's weird. It's not that powerful. And it's, it's certainly not going to win any games, but is definitely going to annoy people and have people like me likely even just scoop and call it quits. So where do you put this? I guess it goes in the four with all the other CEDH cards. So is this going to get played in CEDH? Again, so th that's the situation we get into. With a card like this, your chaos deck, where, where does your chaos, all the dudes have chaos decks, where does that fit in this bracket system? Because most people don't like playing against that kind of stuff, right? So that means we're going to put Scrambleverse in four, but obviously no competitive decks are going to be playing Scrambleverse. So that means Scrambleverse is just not going to get played at all. 
because it doesn't fit in the one or two. I mean, I don't think it does, but it also isn't going to get played by competitive players for obvious reasons. So, you know, where do cards like this fit in the bracket system? Throwing it out there for you guys, for Wizards of the Coast who are trying to figure this out. Where does this fit? One more thing I want to add here that I think is important to note, of course, is your commander. Where does your commander fit in all this? If your commander is Turgrid, I think a lot of people would say, okay, well, that's a four, right? And again, looking forward here, is Turgrid a CEDH commander? Do people play CEDH with Turgrid? I, I don't think they do. It's just one of those commanders that is sort of in, in the, you know, it's in this twilight zone of it's a commander that everyone hates to play against, but it's also not really a CEDH level commander. You know, maybe, maybe not. I'm not a super expert on CEDH and what gets played and what isn't, but where does your commander fit and all that, right? And more to the point, where does your commander fit with regards to if it's in the 99 or if it's in the command zone? Again, we all know there's a difference. There's a big difference between a card being in the 99 and it being in the command zone and you having access to it. Does that fit into the bracket system? Another thing to take into consideration going forward. So there you go. Just a quick little discussion about the whole bracket thing going forward and getting the wheels turning with regards to people, maybe things you haven't thought of yet. And also maybe... If Wizards of the Coast employees happen to be watching my videos. Some stuff to get them thinking about it as well going forward. If they are actually going to use it, I think that likely it will be the scenario. Just some, some things that I've thought about. And these four cards in particular, you guys let me know in the comments below what you think. What brackets do they fall into? Soul Ring, Rest in Peace, Counterspell, and Scrambleverse. Give me your rankings for those cards. That is it for today though, and thanks for tuning in.